So we're very pleased and honored to have our, as our special guest today, State Senator Doug Harrington. Thank you. native of Barton County and resident of Ferndale, he earned his bachelor's degree from Cornell University and a master's from Western Washington University. Senator Erickson has served in the legislature in Olympia since 1998. After six terms in the House, he was elected to the Senate in 2010 to represent the 42nd District, which consists of the northwest corner of Washington State, including Point Roberts. Senator Erickson, uh, plays a leadership role among the state Senate Republicans. As a member of the Senate's uh, Majority Coalition Caucus, he chairs the Senate Energy, Environmental, and Telecommunications Committee. He also serves on the Health Care, Transportation, and Rules Committees. The stated legislative priorities include providing solutions to keep energy prices low, create jobs, and enhance our quality of life. The Senator also brings to us experience and policy perspectives at the federal level. In, two, in January 2017, he accepted the temporary position of Interim Director of Communications in the U.S. EPA as part of the new Trump Administration transition team. I welcome Senator Erickson to share some of those state and national perspectives with us and to take your questions. Great, thank you. so much for the chance to come up and uh, spend a little time with you. Every time I come to Point Roberts, I always wonder why I haven't bought a property to get here yet. And it's just beautiful. I guess I always come at the best time of the year. You know? So it's always in the summertime or in the fall, and it's just phenomenal. So I was driving around. I did come up a bit earlier and um, had a chance to drive around a little bit. It's just amazing. I love it up here. And it's such a great place that you folks have uh, built and created, and it's great to be here. So I'm Doug Erickson, your state senator. 18 years in the legislature. It's been a long time. Uh, since I was first elected in 1998, and every year it's an honor to serve the people of Whatcom County. It's an amazing place, amazing people, and just a lot of fun. I, I got to tell you, the job is always interesting. A um, couple things. I'll, how long do I have on my opening stuff until we get to questions? Well, um, it really is up to you. Okay. We, we sort of figured out. Okay. Here we go. Straight, here we go. We can go straight to questions too. If you guys want to start shooting right away, we can go right there. And we can go to the next one. Oh, no. I got all night. I'm just happy to be here. Um, it was kind of fun. So, you talked about Cornell University, is where I went to school. And so now, my, uh, my daughter, my first daughter, was born from my second election campaign in 2000. And next week, I'm taking her back to go look at Cornell University and have a trip back there and check out some East Coast schools. So we're really coming full circle on everything in, in my term of office here. Uh, like I say, it's just an amazing experience to be able to serve uh, the people up here in Washington County. And especially this amazing place in Point Roberts. Um, interesting thing about the district, this is the only legislative district in the country. You have to go through Canada twice. There's two Canada in your district. And so when I go from Point Roberts, it's the longest drive in Washington, probably the longest drive outside of Alaska to get from Point Roberts for any district. So I go from Point Roberts to New Haven. You have to go down to Skagit County, through Burlington, up through Cedar Rule to get to New Haven. That's how big the district actually is. You know, we have the North Cascades National Park, Mount Baker, the ski area, you know, Point Roberts, obviously. Um, just so many incredible things that we have in our area to be so thankful for. So, um, a couple things for the nice comments I'll give. So, the interesting part about a talk like this is I'm so happy I'm not wearing a tie. You know, it's a bit more cat up here, nobody wearing a tie tonight. But you always want to be a little bit interesting, a bit provocative, and keep it interesting. Always realize that the camera is right there, so you got to be careful what you actually say in any kind of a setting that you're at. But it's just an interesting thing. I'll go to a couple of comments. But I want to start it out with kind of a provocative thing to talk about what shapes what's going on in Washington State, what's shaping going across the border with us right now in Canada. But what's interesting is, is in our world today, we're currently living through the largest mass migration of people in the history of the world. And so it's an interesting one when you think about that in terms of all the people moving all around the world like we have never seen before in the history. Uh, well, since, you know, the last 10,000 years, I suppose, how far back can you actually go? And how that shapes our politics, how that shapes everyday living, how that shapes everything we decide from transportation to education to all that we're doing. And it's an interesting mind point to take. And when I get back to talking about some of the Trump things a bit later, when you think about what's going on in Washington, D.C., 
I think the fundamental rub point is really nationalism versus globalism. And taking in that context about what's going on in D.C. and what's happening really all across the world right now, that's kind of an interesting framework to think about what impact, impacts us here in Washington State because it does every single day in terms of decisions we're making also. Um, legislative session. Unfortunately, we're still in legislative session. So normally in Olympia, we start in January, the second Monday, and we go for 105 days. That ended on April 23rd. Then we had a first special session, a second special session. We're currently in our third special session. Um, that's a bit too much, you know, I think, for a part-time elected official to have to go down and do all that stuff in Olympia. But I want to give you a quick update on what happened on key issues uh, that impact you. Number one is the McCleary decision. Is everybody familiar with McCleary? I mean, basically what it means? No. 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 Okay. Yeah, me either, actually, so I'll give you a quick right here, yeah. And if anybody doesn't know, please correct me. Feel free to pop, uh, pop in here. So the McCleary decision was a court case that was brought against the state of Washington by a school district by some folks out of Port Townsend that said Washington State is not adequately funding basic education, that we are too heavily dependent upon local school levies to pay for basic education, and the government, you have to go and deal with that in Olympia. So, interesting question. My wife's a school teacher. I hear about it all the time in terms of what we have to do to make our schools better, uh, which is also part about how we address McCleary. So to address the McCleary decision, what we have done this year is we have said, and I have to be careful how I say this, but I say it accurately, it basically deals with your local property taxes now. How we make an equitable payment to pay for schools all across Washington State. And there's an issue called levy swap. And what levy swap means is in my opinion, there's a lot of money in education currently. It might not be equally distributed all around the state. So what we decided to do in the legislature this last year is we put in place a new 81 cent per thousand property tax on all people of Washington State. So when you get your property tax bill in 2018, you're going to see a new local, a new statewide levy of 81 cents per thousand to pay for education. Is that now, what we also did at the same time is we said local levies, the ones you get to go and vote on, are going to be reduced to $1.50 maximum in terms of what you pay locally for your property taxes. So we raise taxes in some areas, we lower them in other areas to try to get to this point where the money is coming to Olympia, then redistribute it out so you have equitable distribution of education dollars all throughout Washington State. So what does that mean to Watkin County? Well, that means in 2018, Every single person here in the room is going to see an 81 cent increase in your property taxes. Everything else will remain the same. In 2019, on your property tax bill, your local levy rate, which is in the Ferndale School District, which is where I live, we go from, I forget what it is now, four bucks per thousand down to $1.50, or $3.50 or down to about fifty. So every school district in Whatcom County will see a property tax reduction in 2019. And so by doing that, what we do is we bring the money into Olympia, we aggregate it, and we send it back out to school districts all throughout Washington State. If you own property in Seattle or Bellevue, you're going to see a property tax increase um, because a statewide flat 81 cents per thousand will have a bigger impact on areas where your homes are worth more than the more rural parts of Washington State. So that's how we address the financial aspects of the McCleary decision, mm -hmm. to have one statewide levy well, on top of your existing statewide levy, uh, careful how I phrase that, uh, for property taxes for education of 81 cents, but then a lowering and a lid on all local property taxes for education that are voter approved with $1.50. Sure. Now, in Blaine School District, because you guys have been very frugal, uh, Blaine is the one who will see a slight increase once all these things go into place, unless they decide to lower the $1.50 cap down to about $1.25, and you'll be seeing a, a tax reduction up here in Blaine also. But statewide, we end up with 75% of households seeing a tax reduction. Uh, once this is fully implemented, and about 25% seeing an increase, the biggest increase is down, of course, in the central Puget Sound region of Washington. So that's how we handled the financial aspects of McCleary, which was a big issue that we had to deal with, um, mandated by the courts. Was it the best decision? I don't know. You know, given the circumstances of what the court said and the makeup of the legislature, I think this is probably the best decision we could have had. The other options that were out there uh, were a capital gains tax on high income earners, which is an income tax, a uh, new BNO tax on businesses throughout Washington State, and a tax on energy, 
uh, sometimes referred to as a carbon tax. I call the tax on energy, they call the carbon tax, my friends across the aisle. <laughs> and we thought this would be the best way to do it, to be equitable all across Washington State. And what's interesting about this tax, it's actually the most progressive one you could possibly find by having one statewide cap. If you live in a more expensive area, you're gonna pay more. If your house costs more, you pay more. So in theory, that's kind of a progressive way to tax based upon wealth. But in reality, as we all know, the cost of your house does not necessarily reflect how much income you have coming into your home. And that's where we have to be very careful about property taxes going forward. But overall, uh, once fully implemented, if fully implemented, I think it's probably the best and fairest uh, fix we could have had this whole in a Cleary court case that we've been dealing with for so many years. Senator Erickson, can I interrupt? And of course. Mark, and I apologize. No. Um, can we talk about Boyd Roberts? Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, well, That's why property. everyone's here. Okay. We don't want to hear about the property taxes. Property taxes are point of Excuse me, Joel. Was it actually an point of interest before we get to point of Roberts? <clears throat> um, I appreciate your position, and, and I thought this through fairly carefully. The deepest problem is this reluctance within Washington State to impose an income tax, a progressive income tax. And so what happens is school districts, small communities, the counties, they find themselves in revenue problems. And since there is no progressive income tax, they turn to a variety of devices in order to generate revenue. So Arthur, please but introduce you yourself. <laughs> yeah. well, one of the things that you're I'm sorry. pointing to is, is in fact, regressive. Virtually all of the new ways to generate revenue are regressive. They involve sales taxes, increases in property taxes which get turned down to renters and leasers. Mm -hmm. They involve gasoline taxes, alcohol, tobacco taxes, a variety of nuisance taxes, and they're all regressive. If we were to impose a sensible state-based income tax, that began at relatively high levels, which I believe was a quarter of a million dollars at the last offering, which was turned down. That would go a long way to resolving these problems and not continue to put the burden on folks like us who are not, you know, swimming in, in money. Well, that was a difficult transition. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about Point Roberts. Let's talk about Go in any direction he wants to, uh, but then let's put the questions at the at the end. Oh, yeah, well, you're, you're the moderator, so I'm, I'm happy to handle the way. I'll get to the question of income tax. Okay, I, I guarantee. Sure. And we'll talk specifically about Point Roberts things. I'll and I'll try to cut it short here also because I'd like to go to questions. Yeah. So I can talk about things that I can work on with you, but we want to talk about things that are important to you guys up here in Point Roberts. A um, couple other things I want to hit really quick. Um, the other piece of controversy you might have heard about was this issue where we cut a deal in the legislative session that dealt with um, B&O tax reduction for um, uh, manufacturers in Washington State. And we've been bleeding manufacturing jobs for many years in Washington, and um, we've been trying to address that. So what happened, you guys didn't get the first time to hear this whole story, this is the first group I've actually talked to, to tell the whole story about what happened. The Democrats for years have been trying to get rid of what's called the extracted fuel tax exemption for the oil refiners. And so if you're an oil refiner and you produce energy on site and then you use it on site to power your refinery, it's basically you know uh, uh, gases that you might be flaring. You capture those, you turn them into electricity, you turn them into power to power your facility, you aren't taxed on that. It's kind of like a dairy guy who uses the manure to spread on his field, you don't get taxed on that as fertilizer because you generate it on site and use it on, on your field, you don't get taxed. Well, they've been trying to get rid of this tax exemption for, for years. It's been a big issue. So this year, what we tried to do was to close the Boeing tax loophole. Boeing has a lower manufacturing rate than all of the manufacturers. So we said, let's lower the manufacturing tax rate all across Washington State of all manufacturers to the Boeing rate. Well, the problem was the oil refineries would have seen a disproportionate benefit from that because they're our biggest manufacturers outside of the Boeing company. Um, so what we agreed to was a deal that said we will eliminate the extracted fuel tax exemption if we lower the M &O, the B and O rate across the board for everybody else. It's a deal we all struck, we all shook hands. At the end of the day, the governor vetoed the B and O tax reduction, but left in place the tax increase, 
on the oil refineries here in Whatcom County. And that's been a big bone of contention down in Olympia. We're still struggling with that and how we're going to work our way through it. The other one that we're working on is a purse decision, which deals with well water, uh, both in Whatcom County, all throughout Washington State. And what we have said as a Republican caucus in the Senate is we're not going to pass the capital budget until we get the conclusion on the Hearst decision. And the capital budget is very important to all members of the legislature and all people around Washington State because we pay for school construction, we pay for a lot of things that people want to see happening um, out of that particular fund. But we think it's so important that we address this Hearst decision correctly this year. And now we have to go back and address the governor's veto of this BNO tax on manufacturing to get things settled across the board. So that's kind of in enough big issues. So now let's just go straight to questions. Yeah, I'm going to take the prerogative of inviting <laughs> two of our directors oh, okay. uh, to give them first crack at the And I will get the questions. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So, uh, I'm, and then we'll go to yeah. everybody else. But Judson has a question. So go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I'm Judson Merrill from the Taxpayers Association. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. Um, my background is in, or interests are in emergency preparedness, diversification of the local economy, affordable housing, and a cleaner environment. You supported the solar jobs bill. Um, could you tell us a little bit about why you supported it and how Point Roberts could benefit from it? Well, the solar stuff's very interesting, right? So, we got a manufacturer, Bellingham iTech, does solar panels. Um, and the solar industry got a huge tax incentive package out of Olympia a few years ago, about 10 years ago. And we had the most generous solar incentive package in the world. We were more generous than, than Germany uh, when it came to solar panels and what we were doing. So the problem when you do something like that is an industry group naturally kind of gets hooked on the government subsidy. And so we've been working for a couple of years to get to a way where we can continue a stair-stepping down of solar subsidies as solar panels become uh, more economical as the industry matures. How do we get away from the subsidy model? Because currently what we do is we take money from you and give it to you to put solar panels on your house, which, you know, not a bad thing, right? I mean, it's an interesting thing. But how do we get away from that model and get more towards that solar survive? So what we did this year is we extended the solar subsidy program until 2028, but you have to be into the system by 2021. You can get a maximum of 50% back on your investment through what's called net metering, where you get paid the electricity you send back into the grid, and then we give it a direct subsidy to you. So we give you a benefit on top of that. We give you a, a, a surcharge that we pay back to you. So if people want to get solar panels on their houses, whether you're in Point Roberts or wherever you're at, now is a good time to do it because you get into the system, which is not as generous as the old system, but it's still the ability to get 50% back on your investment over the course of about eight years in terms of what you put in terms of solar, in addition to what you save in terms of the electricity that you're not using. So we'll see how this whole thing works as we move forward. Will solar continue to be a good thing? And here, here's the problem with solar in Washington. It's not because we don't get a lot of sunlight. The rain is actually very good for solar panels because it washes the dust off and it makes it more efficient. You know, you have to clean them all the time. The problem with solar in Washington is our electricity is already so cheap. And that's where the dilemma you get into. If you're looking at it just as a financial decision, we have to make sure that we, it is hard to have the subsidies be big enough to make it a good financial decision in Washington State simply because you got BPA power coming off the hydro dams at a very low rate <coughs> compared to California or Midwest states where they're based on coal. So we're working on it. It was a good bill. I think we got to a great compromise. That's kind of how the legislature is supposed to work, right? Where you come together, you work to get things accomplished. I think it's good for the industry. It'll keep a lot of people employed, putting up solar panels. And uh, but it is a step to getting away from the subsidies long term. So I think overall it's a pretty good deal. Thank you, sir. Okay, one more pre-planted question. Uh, not pre-planted with me. No, no, no. No, that's true. I, I didn't know they were coming. I'm no, sorry. that's true. Not pre-planted with the uh, senators. This is CNN. Uh, but but this this, goes, this one goes to this sort of gives Arthur no. two. No. But Arthur had no. prepared. So go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, Senator. Uh, Martha Reber, um, lately of Brooklyn, New York. is a little close in time from Point Roberts. Um, just in passing, there are also fairly substantial benefits to the fossil fuel industry. It isn't just solar panels that are getting these things. So let's just keep a little balance right. there. Well, that's an interesting question. Well, let's hit that one since you brought it up. Yeah. So the difference between the two right, would be that the oil industry is the largest tax-paying industry in Washington State. 
So that industry pays more taxes than any other industry in Washington. I wonder why. Okay. They generate a lot of stuff. They pay power. No, there's no. Yeah, but, but there are no subsidies to the oil industry in Washington State because you are a net payer of taxes, which is different than the solar package where we're actually subsidizing people to put solar panels on the roof. We're doing it, right? So we, we voted for that. But there's a big difference between people that pay the bulk of the taxes and the solar industry where you're getting the subsidy of people taking it from somebody else and giving it to the person that puts it on the roof. So there's a, a distinction there. Let me speak to the lawyer. Well, no, but you, you brought it up. So okay. Okay. Uh, and let me preface it by saying that I'm an elected fellow of the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, I uh, stay up to date on all of the modern scientific work. I'm still actively involved in research. Um, speak up, Arthur. Uh, speak up. <laughs> speak up, sorry. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm usually told I have to speak up. Um, speak up, Arthur. <laughs> the, um, the, the larger issue has to do with climate change. Yep. And all of the issues having to do with the use of fossil fuels and switching over to alternate energy sources, solar, wind, tidal, various other uh, approaches is really the critical component. Um, as stated, I am in touch with the scientific community. I'm a part of it. It is virtually unanimous that climate change is not only real, it's probably the single most dangerous, devastating event that is occurring on our planet. <coughs> but you have consistently been a climate change denialist. And I just want to know why. Well, thank you so much. Thank there, there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Explain to why you're a denialist. No, seriously. <laughs> Was it that good? Oh, it's great. I don't mind it at all. I'm used to it. I've sat by Jane Inslee for many years, so I'm used to this. Um, so number one, whenever a person uses the term consensus, you're no longer being a scientist, you're now being a politician. That's right. Because there's no such thing as consensus in the world of science. It, it doesn't work that way. Uh, I, I told you where I come from. This I'm is not, not true. Where you come from. I'm not arguing. This is not true. We're not, we're not, this is not arguing. The entire, the entire, the entire board, board of directors Let us and editors are Let us finish. Are Let us finish. And Nature, the two major international journals, multidisciplinary journals, complete agreement, climate change is real and dangerous. That's consensus. Again, if you I go can back to my point, which is no such two, thing in consensus. If you can find one or two scientists who do not agree, that's fine. That does not deflect away from what consensus is. Again, let me give you the distinction, sir, which is in science, there's no such thing as consensus. Once you use the term consensus, you're being a politician. And what you're talking about here in terms of climate change, what you're arguing about, what you're trying to bring up, is there a natural trend to climate? Yes, there is. And so what you're asking the question of, is at the high end of the warms, is it warmer because of man-made activity? And at the low end, when it gets cooler, is it not as cool because of human activity? And what is that delta that you're talking about? Because I think you would agree, everybody would agree, that the Earth naturally warms and naturally cools. There are cycles that it goes through. That's why you have ice age. No, I don't. I don't. Hey, hey, Mark. I, don't, I, don't, I would respect the request. You are the moderator. Ask the audience here. Yeah or nay? How many people no, will leave? Be no. Let them leave. No. 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 So I say, don't no. 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 I'm glad we got right to point Robert if he's like, it's No, let me go there. I'm going to ask everybody. So let everybody speak. And the questioners, let one questioner ask a question. Well, he asked if we agreed, and I said no. That's all I did. He, he, he asked a question, and I said no. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's fine. It's all right. That you don't think the Earth actually warms and cools naturally. Out of the last 17 record heat years, 16 have been in the last 16 years. Oh, okay. <laughs> let me get myself gathered here. We could go back and forth all night long about your stats versus your stats versus other stats that are out there. Um, are the climate data being uh, are they being tampered with? Are they changing the climate data? And the question is yes. NASA and the federal government changes the climate data. They go back and they recalibrate based upon different types of activity. You can go back and look at you can go back and look at Mount Baker. In the 1950s, the glaciers were smaller on Mount Baker than they are today. 
How many scientists are in collusion to do this? <laughs> to do what, sir? I'm not sorry. I, I didn't realize we were kind of climate today here. We want to have something to come up here. But <laughs> <laughs> you actually were talking about climate all night. Climate deniers. So I think it was of interest to, to your constituents. You actively deny climate change on your Facebook page, for instance. So I'm sorry, sir. I think it just well, that was an issue. What did that just happen? a few days ago, you well, posted Well, give me the example, sir. Well, I don't have cell service sitting here, but uh, just a few days ago, you, you reposted an article. Uh, to, it was a climate change. It was an obvious climate denial change. No, no, hold on a second. So hold on, hold on. 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 Okay, I don't, I, I don't know the name of the article that you posted. What did the article refer to? What was it about? It was talking about glacial melt or something. I don't, I don't remember. You have no idea what it was, yet you're bringing it up. Okay. I mean, what Great. was it about? The point is, is you brought up climate change a few days ago. That was the point I was trying to make. This guy people might be concerned. So bring up the article that you're referencing. What, what was it about? Something beyond glacial melt. What was it about? I don't know. You should, you should know. You, 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 you brought it up. I mean, you brought it up. So what was I it? I brought it up, pointing out that you are a denialist. That's why people no, 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 sir, sir. You're, you're throwing out charges. I'm just asking you. It's not what a charge. Was it what was it about? No, I don't even have one question. You know, generally, what was sure, it about? Sure, you're well, right. I have mean, like one question. No, please, no. No, really, what was it about so I can answer your question? Uh, to be fair, uh, I, 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 I can only tolerate this kind of nonsensical uh, uh, alternative fact that you're trying to dictate so much that it's difficult for me to read the alternative news source which you, you posted on your Facebook, but it was clearly not a credible media source which you posted. It made me uncomfortable being your constituent. Senator I would like to interrupt so I'm asking you, so are you denying the climate science? Seems like so let's go back are you denying your house? You know, yes or no? So, sir, you just okay. power down for a yeah. second? Yeah. 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 Are you denying yeah. your house? Yeah. Are you a climate, yeah. the climate yeah. change yeah. denier yeah. or not? Yes or no? That's all we need. Because we're going to vote for you. We're going to vote for you, right? Are you a climate denier or not? Hold on, sir. Right. Sir, back it up. No. Are you or not? Yes or no? Wow. I'm not really sure if this is what everybody intended this meeting to be tonight. No, uh, but it's not really why I came here. So this gentleman over here raised a question about a Facebook post. Yes, sir. It was a posting about temperatures in Greenland. And Greenland hit a record low temperature in August. Yes or no? What was that? Hold on a second. There was no commentary. I simply pointed out that you didn't, you didn't read. No, I did read. It was obviously written in a way to make up people. That was my point. You shouldn't be so divisional. You shouldn't be so divisive. On, I'm not on sure why you're so scared of the fact that Greenland had a very cold day. I don't know why. I don't know why you, as a Whatcom County uh, a representative or pardon me, senator, felt the need to post it. How is that relevant to your constituents if you were trying to bait people? I just thought it was odd that you chose that. I think it's odd that you bring it up without even looking at it, sir. But let's move on to a different topic. I'm not sure if everybody came here to have this argument. But, uh, just one, one more thing. One more thing. Here we go. Part of the problem is, and a lot of people don't, don't quite get this. Uh, hang on a second, please. It's not temperature. Climate change is manifested. You know, I don't know. If you want to have a climate change debate, we can set it up for next time. We can have a climate change debate. So you can bring your charts, I can bring my charts, we can look at it. But I'm not sure if everybody came here tonight to hear people pontificate about the views on climate change. I just want to finish this extended sentence and then I will stop. <laughs> no, but it's not temperature. That's one manifestation of climate change. I never. The thing you just pointed to, which is the coldest temperatures, yes, in fact, is exactly what is predicted because variance goes up. Variability of climate goes up. That's the first dramatic impact of it. The secondary components are changes in migration patterns of species. The reason that the pine bark, pine bark beetle has been devastating forests is because the temperatures in the northern forests aren't cold enough to kill the larva. There are changes in corals and in coral reefs. There are shifts in ocean currents. There's changes yeah, in Sir, the you just want to come have a podium up here. You're welcome to. Everybody knows this. Hey, all the stuff. Hey, Garden, the size of Delaware just peeled off yesterday. 
which everybody has said is absolutely normal. All the scientists have said it has nothing to do with At this with point, I am, I am done, and if you don't believe that those are evidence of climate change, so be it. Do you want to call me? I'm not easy. I, 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 I can do it all night. But really quick here, before we go on, uh, I'm happy to talk about this, but I would approve, I, I appreciate people who use you know, name calling or try to be antagonistic or be angry. We're here to have a conversation in Whatcom County about issues that are important to you. And so when you get really angry and say, I'm your beast, you did this, and you yell, you're a denier, you're a denier, that's not really helpful towards having a conversation about issues that we care about in Whatcom County, right? So I appreciate the dialogue, I appreciate the debate, do we have the money? But I'm not going to say that you're a bad person because you hold your viewpoints. So please do not try to say that I'm a bad person because I have views that might be different than yours or I may have a different interpretation of things that are out there. So let's try to be like we do it in Whatcom County, which is have a good conversation without being antagonistic and negative towards everybody. So if we can just do that, we're going to talk about it. Thank you, Senator, for taking a uh, We'll start back here. Yeah, sorry. Sorry for that. Maureen Duard from 2144 First Street, Point Roberts. Thank you, Senator, for taking so much time out of your busy schedule. On behalf of some of the Maple Beach residents who have been flooded for many years, and I, I was just wondering if Whatcom County has a plan for this coming winter to help the residents out. They've lost their appliances three times, I think, over the last 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered if Whatcom County could maybe help some of those residents. They are on the waterfront, Maple Beach area. That's all I'm just asking. Okay, and I'm trying to understand. So one of the things about our, our job in the state legislature is that might be more of a question for the county in terms of if the county has a program to be able to help out in that particular situation. The way it normally would work is the county council would then, if they needed additional resources to be able to address something, they would then contact us at the state level and we would see what we could do to be able to help out. So normally that question would be good for your county council member or for uh, Executive Louse uh, on that to start out with and then it would filter up to us as they make requests to us for dollars to be able to help out in emergency situations. So sorry I can't say yes to it, but that's kind of the process that we go through to be able to, to triage and get money out to people on an emergency basis. So Thank you. Yes, yes ma'am. Or yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I'll let you. I thought it was the sleep. Did you have Okay, so she's a deal. Oh, she was proxy for you. Okay, yeah. please. So, hello, my name is Jeff Nelson. So this is my daughter. She's 18. But, um, question about Hanford. Yep. And I think I think this is a nonpartisan issue. Uh, we can probably agree, no matter what side of aisle you're on that. I think there's valid concerns about what's happening over there. Yeah. Um, the management and uh, uh, the competence or lack of it and the standard of care that's, has nothing to do with the legislators or um, the executive branch in Washington. They're going to do with the Department of Energy and bureaucrats in Washington who I think are absolutely failing uh, to protect the, uh, the residents of the state of Washington. So I'm curious to know what, well, I know, I hear you. It could be done better. Yeah. And so just, just to get a, a, a a gauge from you and uh, what you might even want to say from uh, your, your colleagues about the level of concern um, as you're watching this, which really is you served by the federal government for the most part. And how do you all, how do you all deal with it? In, in a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. One of the things I, I, I was trying to really cautious about Hanford. A couple of years ago, the local media, the, the Seattle media, reported the leak in one of the tanks, right? So Hanford. Hanford is legacy waste, just to be really clear right now. We're not talking about Energy Northwest. We're not talking about the Columbia Generating Facility, which is a nuclear facility in, in Tri-Cities that produces electricity currently. The Hanford situation is legacy waste left over from the military efforts, basically. Um, there was a leak in one of the tanks over there, and all of a sudden, overseas uh, countries, Japan, Korea, started canceling their, their Timothy Hay orders because they were afraid it was contaminated with radiation. There was no issue with that, so we had to go back in and explain what was actually happening in terms of what we're doing to contain within the tanks, that there was no exposure, 
that the crops were not being contaminated with radiation. So I'm always really cautious when I talk about Hanford, because we should be, and we do, we do need to do better at Hanford. Uh, one of the interesting parts is I did spend 120 days back in Washington, D.C. as the Communications Director for the EPA. One of the main areas I was working on was actually methods to be able to clean up Hanford faster and better um, and changing what's called the Tri-Party Agreement. The Tri-Party Agreement is a deal that was negotiated by Governor Gregoire when she was the Attorney General with regards to Hanford cleanup. And so we're trying to change that to manage our risk better in Hanford, get things cleaned up a lot faster than they would normally be done, and do it a lot more economically, um, not by cutting corners, but by getting it done quicker, which is going to save us billions and billions of dollars over time. The tunnel collapse over there is a huge deal in Hanford. We put money into the budget this year to try to address some of the issues that came from that, prevent those things from happening in the future. One of the things we're also working on is getting the new Secretary of Energy, Perry, out here, and uh, uh, our new uh, 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 EPA director, uh, Scott Pruitt, to come out to Hanford this fall when we're going through one of the cleanup completions for the building that's be as a section that's going to be cleaned up, and they're going to be having a, a, an event over there. We're trying to get them to come out also and look at it, which will be very important, I think, to bring attention to the situation. Worker safety is critical at Hanford. We had legislation in the House this year that talked about benefits for people that work at Hanford, and we'll continue to work on that in the future, but that's also a bit more of a federal issue, but getting those people out here to see what's happening, I think, is very important to see that happen. Yeah. So that's what I know about. So, Mark, can I speak? No. <laughs> I'm going to call on somebody else. Uh, <laughs> you were next. My friend from Italy. Like you said, you love my brother, so do I. I owned property for 40 years. My kids grew up in point of poverty. I paid my tax, I support the community, and I had mobile trade in my property, in a small bag, in a gazebo. The county forced me to remove the trailer with the deck. Now they forced me to remove the gazebo. <coughs> it's only a quarter mile from here. It's a private lot. I don't have no neighbors. I'm good to my neighbors. My, the neighbors are good to me. And tomorrow it's a deadline to remove my gazebo, which is my pride and joy, to enjoy a glass of wine. This way, bro. So that's your opinion. This is supposed to be free country or humanity. Yeah, I, hate, I, hate, I hate hearing questions like that. No, 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 It's like when I hear about the um, uh, Hearst decision, the impact it has on people by not being able to use their property the way they would like. And you're going to hate my answer, which is, as a state senator, that is a county decision. And there's nothing I can do about it. I can call Jack and say, I wish you wouldn't do this, but the key is it's, it's up to the council and up to your planning director to make that decision. And we have this division of powers within the government where you know, there are local issues, there are the state things that we're responsible for, then there's the federal issues. And as a state senator, I'm not responsible for local zoning decisions and that type of permitting activity. And so I wish I could help, because I, you know, I think it's ridiculous. And as I look at private property, people need to have the ability to responsibly manage their private property in a way that is fair to the community, but doesn't, if you don't impact your neighbor, you should have the ability to do things. I just, I look at the thing we're in right now, and I think there are probably a hundred ways the state could come in and shut this down, you know, in terms of the ability of people wanting to be able to use it for a benefit of their community. And that's where we have to transition back. I think the pendulum has swung too far to one end. We've got to bring it back to center and give people the ability to do it. trying to say is I, I can call the county executive and talk to him but it's not, be good. it's not a decision that I can make personally I don't, I don't know how, I'm not the decision maker on that type of an issue that's your local government that makes that decision of course but, but yeah you, you would agree no, I'd love to I'm going to try to facilitate but that's all I can do for I, I wish I could do more Hi. I would like to know how Washington Apple Care and WIC will be affected if the Affordable Care Act is repealed that's a great question you know, um, one of the things in Washington State we already had, the only way that's really going to be impacted is through Medicaid expansion, I believe. So Washington State did a very large Medicaid expansion when it first became available. 
moved a lot of our budgetary responsibilities over to the federal government. It was about $300 million at the time. I think it's swollen to over half a billion dollars in terms of Medicaid expansion that we that we brought in. Um, it all depends on what the replacement is in Washington, D.C., so it's really hard to give an answer. In terms no replacement of what for Medicaid, Bill. What's that? There's no replacement for Medicaid. They're taking money away from Medicaid. Actually, you know, again, it's a hypothetical you the question you're asking. So there is a House proposal, there might be a Senate proposal. And again, folks, you know, I'm in the state legislature. I don't vote on the federal issues, right? So. But the state can increase the funding for those programs that the federal government produces. Oh, we could. We already have some of the most generous programs. We already had the most generous programs for that before Obamacare went to place. So you have to keep that in mind in terms of levels. And even on the Medicaid, even on the hypothetical of what I saw out of the House proposal, they still grow Medicaid over the next 10 years above what it is today. And I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert on that because I don't serve in the U.S. Congress. I serve in the State Senate and the Levy. So but what I saw, what I read, and what I thought I heard was that under the House GOP plan, Medicaid grew not as fast as under Obama. I'm just saying, if you could, I don't know, I, I thought it was like a 10% increase over so, the next 10 years. So if uh, if it gets repealed, will the state make uh, changes to keep up the expansion in the state? What's, okay, here's what happened on Medicaid expansion in Washington State, because we already had Apple Health for Kids, we already were giving people health care coverage up to, I forget what the percentage was of poverty, higher than all the other states. So even when the Obamacare stuff went through, what happened was they moved a lot of the responsibility the state was paying for onto the federal government. Do you know what I mean? And so if, if it's repealed in total, it's a legislative decision to say if we're going to come back and move that money that we had moved out of the state programs and move it back in is what I'm saying, but it's hard to give an answer to a hypothetical because we don't know what would be in the federal bill to know how much money would have to be moved. And so that's why, and me not being in the federal legend, uh, federal Congress, I can't give you an answer of what the specific details on because I'll never vote on that at the federal level. You will at the state level, though. But yes, I, yes, but what I'm getting to is we can't say what the impacts will be because we don't know what the legislation is that may or may not be passed in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, I just want to change the subject here a minute because we, we're calling on this. What I want to change the subject to is primarily is let, let's talk about something else, which is what do you think? Let's look at what point Roberts for change. Yeah, let's go to this. this yes, thank, thanks for making it this call. Uh, I was, uh, uh, just close, I think we're close to the key. Speak up, please. Can't hear, Can't hear uh, what you're saying. Liz Ireland, thank you. Uh, I've been here for about seven months. Um, I, I, that's a good job. Yeah, the Still, um, Still can't hear you. Don't uh, <laughs> <laughs> yell, you guys. Okay, okay. Projection. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that you were on the board of telecommunications agency. Of course. The, 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 uh, the committee I chair, I chair the Senate Energy Environment and Telecommunications. Yes. So uh, what is, uh, is there something being done to support the ISPs, the Nathan service providers that we have? Like we have with Intel up here, Yelp is obviously in Canada, but is there anything being done to support the ISPs to help so rural communities like us? Oh, rural broadband one. Yes. Yeah. Um, great question. Thank you very much. A piece of legislation I actually sponsored this year. Um, we're working on it very hard. So I sponsored legislation this year for 5G deployment in Washington <laughs> State. And 5G is your next iteration of, of high-speed internet connections, which takes it to the next level. I kind of like it because uh, it's super fast. You can download a movie in two seconds. I don't know if you really need to be able to download a movie in two seconds. And if you want to have driverless cars, you need 5G. So how does that help Point Roberts? Would be the question. How does this help uh, Washington? How does this help rural Washington State? And what we're trying to do, you know, tens of billions of dollars or hundreds of billions of dollars are going to be invested in 5G networks in America. And we want that investment to flow to Washington State. So we're working right now to create the atmosphere where that money is going to flow to Washington, and we're going to be able to have a better internet service all over Washington, whether you're in downtown Seattle or whether you're in Point Roberts. And the goal there is we're working on stuff with the PUDs to lower the cost of deployment of broadband into rural areas and those types of aspects. So we had a comprehensive piece of legislation that didn't pass this year. We're going to continue working on the interim. That's the goal. Um, and we're working with private business. We have a big tax incentive package for companies to 
Floyd brought in in the rural areas. We're working on getting to the interim because we couldn't get it passed this year. But that's a big issue that we're working on bringing to all parts of Washington State, not just downtown Bellingham. So, so what can you do from a place like Point Brothers to help support that? Well, you should support my legislation. I forget the bill number, but we'll, 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 we'll work on it. Doing the interim. We'll have hearings in the interim, so just stay in touch with my, my webpage. It's Doug at SenatorErickson.com. You can find out about the 5G legislation on there. Uh, we keep it posted all the time and try to keep it updated. There'll so, be lots of meetings. It's a big issue. So here's what we're Hi there. So I think you're uniquely positioned to answer this as a part of Trump's EPA transition team. Yeah. And I'm trying to understand what's going on at the EPA. It really seems to me like they're gutting it. Now, I want to know how this is going to affect states, because states are actually the ones, it seems to me at least, that are going to be picking up where the EPA is now going to be leading off. So and this also gets into regulations where they're onerous, supposedly, and they're being gotten rid of. But does that mean that states actually have the right to say no to things where you know it was regulated under federal law before, and states are going to be able to perhaps say, we still want that, and the federal um, won't be able to override that anymore? There's a lot to unpack in that question. All right, so a lot of moving pieces in terms of what you asked. You know, number one is the EPA being gutted. Um, I think that the focus of the EPA is to get back to its core mission. And I think in Washington State, what you would see under the reforms of the Trump administration would be faster risk management and cleanup of Superfund sites and contaminated sites all throughout Washington State. So that's one of the core missions of the EPA is to get those things cleaned up quicker. On the regulatory front, it's kind of interesting. Um, I've had people approach me about wanting you know, to have federal mandates on the state now because they're afraid that Washington State will go so much further than the EPA. So here it goes back to the 10th Amendment again. Um, and again, we go back to the 10th Amendment, which says the states have the full ability to pass tougher laws than what the EPA is saying you have to pass. So whether it's on water quality standards, whether it's on all types of things, the state can pass a more stringent rule and regulation that is mandated by the EPA. The way it's happened in the past has been that the states have tried to blame the EPA by saying the EPA is forcing me to do this. Um, that might not be the case much longer um, with the new administration as they do go back and change some of these rules and regulations um, to make them more workable. I'll give you a quick example, and this is it's an interesting issue. It deals with water quality standards, what's called fish consumption. And so there was a move in Washington State with the EPA to change fish consumption rules, which is the amount of uh, chemicals or different things that get into your water. But the problem was they were trying to put in place restrictions that cannot be measured with existing technology, and you cannot meet with existing technology. So it's really hard when you have a standard out there that nobody knows what it means because you can't measure to it and the technology doesn't achieve what it's supposed to achieve. And it puts a bunch of manufacturing jobs at risk throughout Washington State. So I believe what we can work on is this place where industry and government works together in a common sense way to continually improve our environment, but do it in a way that's not gigantic steps at one time that can't be met, which simply drives jobs out of Washington State. So, um, so I understand your question. I think states can exceed federal requirements on many of the issues I think you're bringing up. You, but there's another issue out there, which is your uh, uh, interstate commerce laws. So things you can't say, I'm not going to have a train come through Washington, for example. But you can have different restrictions in terms of air quality and water quality standards of what the EPA requires. So I think I kind of got to part of your question. Well, again, I, 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 this comes down to isn't a, the burden of the budget, for instance, for the EPA that's going down by at least a third going to be now transferred to the state of Washington to pick that up? That's two different things you're talking about there. So um, I'm not sure what that means. What does it mean if you cut EPA's budget by a third? How does that actually impact people on the ground in Washington State? Well, well won't you, like the legislature in Washington, then have to increase what they do? Why? As opposed to what they just relied on the federal government to do it, and now it's going to be a Washington state government. I think what you have to go do back and take a look at is what those dollars are actually being used for. Right? Are they being used efficiently? Are they being used effectively? Are they actually accomplishing any environmental goals? You know, that, that's what you have to go look at first and then say, well, if there are things that are actually being done well that are accomplishing environmental goals, then maybe Washington State should look at back to those. But I think if you look at the budget and the way it's going to be cut, I think that the impacts in terms of actual environmental protection on the ground in Washington State will be minimal to negligible 
and we can backfill those very small amounts if they do occur. So I think you have to go back and take a look at what happens. Again, it's a hypothetical. You read the newspaper, they're going to cut EPA funding by a third. Well, what does that mean? You know, we have a Region 10 office in Seattle with 600 employees and a $300 million budget. You have, I'll go, I'll go back to Hanford really quick also, which was a good example. So when the tunnel collapsed at Hanford, I believe there were like 28 federal and state agencies that responded to that tunnel collapse. Well, what are most of those 28, I'm just, it might not be 28 speaking to the camera, maybe about 28, so don't quote me and say 28 is that. But what I'm, what I'm saying is, were all those 28 agencies necessary to go to Hanford to set up a camp and report back to their people above them about what was happening in Hanford and watching the other people do the work to try to figure out what had happened? And that's where I think we have a lot of, a lot of uh, redundancy, unnecessary use uh, from the federal, state, local governments, where we have too many people responding to those types of things. And we could do it better, and we could manage our risk better, and we could accomplish better things faster yeah. By, by doing it that way. So there, there's lots of things. Maybe you go on Hanford for a long time. We could talk about this for, for hours. Um, but that's, we're talking philosophically about it. So you heard a lot about the Puget Sound Partnership and $28 million that may or may not come to Washington State uh, because of the cuts to the EPA. That may or may not happen. Number one, those haven't happened yet. There are proposals. Um, we'll see what the Congress actually does with that. Well, $28 million out of a $43, $44 billion Doug, I have to say, most people here don't realize what Hanford is. Hanford is... That's not true. It's a fucking... Uh, so, please. So stop the nonsense. And Hanford's the largest, uh, Hanford is the largest super fun site in the world. I mean, oh, it's, it's, it's a very difficult spot. I'm not, I'm not underplaying it. But what I'm saying but is there, there are... No, sir, I'm not. I'm saying there are ways that we can do it more efficiently and effectively to get it cleaned up faster. And the best way you can manage risk is to clean it up as quickly as possible. So we're about, what, $14 billion into a vitrification plant that was supposed to cost $4 billion in Hanford. We're nowhere near getting that thing done yet, so I got stuff sitting in tanks yet, waiting for a vitrification plant to get finished so I can vitrify it and send it down to uh, Nevada, to a mountain, where we can't send it to yet, right? So there's where you get into these problems in terms of how you clean things up. So we have to manage risk by doing things quicker and better manages your risk the best way to get it out of there and, and to move it. That, that's a very important part about how you handle these sites. So I appreciate your, I appreciate your question. I appreciate everybody's questions here tonight. I'm just providing a, a viewpoint you might not have. Yes, yes, sir. The distance between uh, Lopez Island, and not Lopez, but Paytas Island and East Point is approximately a quarter of a mile. That is where 90% of our shipping out of Vancouver goes to. If the Trans-Canada Pipeline comes in, you can add another 20 ships per day going past Pedas Island. You've got all these container ships coming into Roberts Bank, which employs about 10,000 people. You've got coal ships coming and going here. What are you going to do if they run into each other and we've got a, a 800 foot coal or oil ship spewing its contents. Is anybody in this on the state level concerned with this area? Most people forget about North Puget Sound or this area. It's 100 square miles no one ever talks about. From here to there and Blaine over to yeah. Canada. Yeah, Senator, what do you think about that? Is anybody doing anything about protecting the islands from Yeah, we that. talk about it all the time, actually. And we have response plans in place currently. We, we have spent a lot of money on it. We, we are investing huge sums of money for oil spill response in, in Washington State. Now, when you talk about the Trans-Canada Pipeline, which, again, I have no control over Trans-Canada Pipeline expansion, whether or not that happens. But we have had the people from the Trans-Canada Pipeline come and talk to my committee twice about what they are trying to do. I have been to their meetings myself. And the thing that happens up there, Trans-Canada issues, and it's not 20 a day, I think it's 34 a month. So anyway, I, I'm not going to go back and forth on the exact numbers of how many new uh, tankers would be going through. What would happen if that thing is built, the mitigation requirements for the, the, the prevention requirements would be very large. And you would see a lot more assets for spill response placed across Vancouver Island and through all the parts of Canada. So in some ways, um, that would be beneficial in terms of spill response. Now you're asking, does it increase the risk 
of having a catastrophic oil tanker spill if you increase the amount of uh, tankers going through that particular area. What if That's the risk what that we have to be able to on the Canadian side? What if there's a spill on the Canadian side? Are you guys in Canoots? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you should see it. When we have our joint spill response activities out here at the refineries, the amount of money we spend on these activities are very low. We have the best spill response system in the entire world. Now, I know you're the center. center. I know you're the center. Here. Here's, here's the deal. deal. We live here. We yes, are so concerned. Not. We are concerned about all of this. Yeah, right? so am I. Yeah. yeah. So, no, we're so not. We don't live here. here. We live right like down it. the road, right? Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> thank you for coming out. Oh, thank you so much. Honestly, we're not leaving for you. We're very appreciative of your being here. Very appreciative. I see a hand in the back. Somebody that hasn't asked a question. Mark, you can if nobody else can. Wait, wait, wait just a minute. Is there anybody in there? I would like to finish the issue on oil spill response. You know, for the gentleman's question back here. Um. One of the interesting things to go out and check out is when we do have the joint oil spill response activities at the refineries in Washington State. Um, Washington State is the model for oil spill response. Now, number, number one is prevention, right? And we are also the leader in the world in terms of comes preventing oil spills from occurring. Um, but we do have a, a huge oil spill response infrastructure built up in the Puget Sound area to handle that. Now, one of the interesting things we're taking a look at this summer, we're having a committee hearing on it, is a transition from some of these tankers who are called articulated tar tugs and barges, ATDs, articulated tugs and barges, which are pushing oil to the Puget Sound. Some people are trying to say we're moving a lot more crude and refined product by ATB right now. We're trying to find out if that's actually true and what our prevention mechanisms are in place for ATBs to make sure we aren't having a spill and what the response mechanisms would be if there is a spill that's involved with that. So. We, we spent a lot. Now, the Canadians are behind us on this because they don't have a lot of refineries built up there. They have not had the regulatory system that we have had down here. In theory, and this would be a very interesting thing for you guys to go and check out as the opportunity to exist, and I invite them to come here and actually present to you because I think they'd be happy to do it, to talk about the additional spill response capacity that will be put in place if the pipeline goes in. And I'd really encourage you to invite them to come down here and go to their PowerPoint and explain it to you. Is the IJC still alive and well? Is the last The IJC, International Joint Commission. On oil spill response? Are they still alive? I'm not sure about the answer of that particular one. I know that we share assets across the board. I'm not sure if that's what it's actually It's 15 miles on each side of the border. And it's six, people, six men, three from there. And three. Oh, oh, in terms of looking, I'm not sure about that, but I do know that we have joint spill response and we're coordinating with the Canadian. You know, that's any event along the U.S.-Canadian. I, I don't know. That, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's what it's called, it's still or if that's the mechanism we're currently using. So I, I have a question. Okay. Right. Oh, it's still, it's still behind the bar. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, regarding Point Roberts and solar, yeah. which Justin's kicked it off. Would you compare and contrast you and Morris's bills, which he seems to be saying, at least quoting in the papers, that that uh, you're not cooperative with his changes or something like that, and. And I've read the differences, but I'd like to hear it from you. Well, I mean, we, we passed a piece of legislation this year. Um, Jeff is very, very smart and very good at what he does in terms of the techn technical aspects of pieces of legislation. So I think that they are very similar in many ways. Um, I think my legislation ended up costing the taxpayer less than what Jeff's legislation had proposed. And that was able to be able to get it passed through our budgetary process. So we limit our exposure um, over the course of the program to $100 million, which to me still seems like a lot of money, uh, $100 million for, for solar subsidies over the course of the program. Um, it's hard to go through without a line-by-line -line comparison in terms of what the big changes are. I think Jeff might have had a higher subsidy rate. I'm not sure, because he's had many different variations of the bill as we're working our way through the process. At some points, he had higher subsidy rates for um, uh, in-state manufactured equipment. Uh, we might have equaled that out a bit more for multiple reasons, some being trade restrictions and competitive clauses. Jeff might have had an issue there dealing with out-of-state solar companies like Solar City that were coming out. I'm not sure if that was in his final bill that he was proposing. So again, there were lots of iterations of these things, so it's hard to have, it's not like you have one stagnant one here and one stagnant one here you can pair straight up. But I think that the main difference is um, we did tend to have a, a, a less generous subsidy rate in the bill that was passed, what Jeff might have been proposing to so what about the utility? Um, you're giving us a waiver for, I'm not sure that's the right word, waiver for utilities to help them with uh, 
perhaps if they're burning carbon, you know, carbon-based fuels, that perhaps they get a little, a little bit of a break while there's a transition going on, which might be a great idea, but I, I didn't quite understand it. I'm not sure what that one is. Um, the governor did sign the bill. You know, I'll, I'll, let me hit on the carbon thing really quick. So for, for the people here, so part of that carbon, my view is, is that we need to transition to the best energy sources we possibly can in a way that benefits our society. It's not something you can do instantaneously, right? There's a transition period involved. And so I had legislation, I'm actually the only legislator to actually, a legislator to actually pass a carbon reduction bill out of either the House or the Senate. Didn't pass the House, we passed it out of the Senate. And what we did was we took initiative 937, which take, currently takes your money to pay for windmills to put up in eastern Washington. And we said utilities, instead of building windmills that we don't need, you can go out and put solar panels on people's houses. You can do retrofits of low-income housing to save energy. You can invest in carbon reduction activities as a credit against 937. Let me give you an example of what they could have done. That's my that proposal. You. And I, this is this is, and what they could have done is gone to Washington State Ferries and said, we're going to convert Washington State Ferries from diesel to liquefied natural gas. That would have reduced particulate emissions all throughout Washington State. It would reduce your carbon footprint. And the utilities could have invested in that. Um, and Talco right now is going through a, a transition where they're going to be converting their pot lines to a new technology. Um, under this bill that we, that we didn't pass, the utilities could have come in and invested in that carbon reduction. And that's the way you get the best carbon reduction for the dollar you want to spend in Washington State. And that's the way I look at this is how you move to a cleaner energy system and how you incentivize people to get that done in the free markets. And this was a way that we could have changed that to make it work for Washington State. We'll keep working on it in the future. Good ideas take time. Okay, I have a question. Let's go back here first. Yes, uh, my name is Bronwyn Glor, and I'm uh, maybe the newest resident. I just officially moved here a week ago. Oh, congratulations. And from New Jersey, um, the home of the Double congratulations. <laughs> the home of the most super fun sites, and not just per square mile, but overall in the entire the garden nation. It's the garden and, state, yeah. and I'm an environmental science teacher, so I'm sure you can right. imagine my concern when I heard the proposed budget cuts and the director of the EPA being somebody who previously wanted to do away with it. Yeah. So given that, I'm trying to figure out. I don't I'm not sure if you said that. But it's, okay. Ahead. Okay, maybe I'm wrong. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to not make a hypothetical. So perhaps could you name, you, you talked about how if the um, state, if the federal you know, regulations drop, that the state could step up and in fact impose stricter regulations. Can you talk about a couple of regulations that you would absolutely suggest be increased to protect the environment or places where Washington is not up to the U.S. standards where you would say, well, if those drop, I would stand for, you know, s stepping forward in this area or that area. Can you make any commitments about what sorts of regulations you would stand for? I'm, I'm trying to think of, of examples you bring up. So number one, by definition, the state's already meeting all the federal mandates and restrictions put in place because of the Fed's mandate, you have to meet it. So we're, we're already there at that part of it. So I guess the example I would go through. So if all those fell away, can you give some examples well, of where you would absolutely fight to maintain what had already been in place and not retract to some previous point or something? All, all regulations aren't going to fall away, number one. I'm but making... Without making a hypothetical, I'm making yeah. a hypothetical. Let me give you an example on, on the fish consumption rules, right? So this is, again, we spent six years on this in the legislature, so it's hard to go over it in 90 seconds and, and talk about what the fish consumption rules actually were. This is very much in the weeds and the details. But <clears throat> Washington State worked with industry groups for over six years to put together a fish consumption rule, which is water quality standards, um, that were manageable, that were doable. The business community screamed. They said they didn't like it. But we got to the point at the end of the day where we put together rules and regulations that, that worked for Washington State. They were probably the most extreme in the country. Uh, when we did them, but they, they were agreed to. EPA, under the past administration, came in and said those aren't good enough and redid our fish consumption rule. Now, I think that was wrong, and I think the EPA should not have done that the way they did. So it's a different example than what you're talking about where the state put together their rules. The EPA came in and said they wanted more on top I'm of I'm going the other way. So what would what do you think is in place that you would fight for if they were reduced? I'm not sure what would be reduced. Well, I mean, that's what I'm getting Forestry, at. invasive species, uh, climate change, carbon tax, anything. You pick your... Healthcare. You know. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, and okay, so I'm not trying to think of something that's currently being considered to be to be you know done away with. You know, I mean, pesticides. Um, yeah. Pesticides. national but the, these are all different things. See, some of these things are environmental regulations, and some of these things are just where you spend money, right? So there's a difference between the two different things. One is you want to spend money on a program. You know, when you talk about Crest and EPA, a lot of it is reductions of what's being spent on programs out there, not necessarily things that actually benefit the environment. That's where the distinction is. Um, simply spending a dollar at EPA does not improve your environment, just like simply spending a dollar in K-12 does not make a child smart. It's how you use that money in, in the system to make it work. So I, I'm having a hard time getting to where you're saying, what if they repeal you know, X, Y, or Z, which I don't, I, I don't see them doing it. They are not doing it in a haphazard way, which is just, we're just going to come in and cut all these things out. That, that's not the way it works. You know, so when you look at things like uh, what's happening on the, on the climate rule, for example, or on the clean air rule that was put into place probably illegally by the, by the Obama administration and not even passed by Congress, so that'll probably go away, you know. Washington State already has rules in place on that, so I'm, I'm having a hard time trying to find an example. If you give me one, I can try to answer it, but I can't think of one. I, being brand new, I, I yeah. don't know the Washington regulations that well, okay. admittedly. Okay. Income tax, <laughs> different topic. I don't want to get into I want to get into income tax. Roy Roberts has a transportation benefit district. Yeah. There's now something like $800,000 in the fund. It's very difficult to spend because of the restrictions on how transportation generated revenues can be spent. The old 18th Amendment. Okay. Two years ago, you were a sponsor of a bill to modify some of the language in one, uh, in one uh, part of the RCW. Um, that would have allowed more flexibility in the way these monies could be spent. And then you withdrew your support. You and Luann both supported it. You withdrew your support, and the uh, amendment, the text amendment is what it was, disappeared. Can you explain why you withdrew your support? I'm not really sure what exactly you're talking about. I think the issue you're talking about, however, is being able to use the gas tax to pay for transit. Yes. Correct? It was to, yeah. but to, to, be, to be a little, little more detailed. There, there's a um, a, a clause that was put in place. Pete Kremen was behind it when he was the exit, when he was in uh, Olympia. It's, it's your local option gas tax. You, right. you, you, you that, that, but that, yeah. that that allowed for transportation benefit districts to be established on the border. Well, the, you know, that's different. There's a second it's clause. Different. There's TBDs all over the state. That, right? Yes, no, the TBDs, all, but these are the ones specifically really. Re, re, yes, 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 the border tax is you do a penny gas tax. That's, that's correct, yes. Up to a penny. Yes. And you want to be able to use that, the gas that, tax. But there's, there's, yes. yeah. there's, there's, there's a second clause the within the RCW that specifies the way in which monies can be spent. The clause that put the, these acts in place has relatively liberal language in terms of how these monies can be spent. But the clause that specifies how monies can be spent is much more restrictive. Mm -hmm. And that, according to the lawyers in Olympia, is the clause that controls the way in which the monies can be used. Yep. What we were looking to do, we were working with, with uh, uh, W. Cobbs, uh, Watton Council of Government, a uh, lobbyist who was working with you at the time, to take the wording in the second component of the RCW and apply it to the first. See, your, your, your problem is you want to use gas tax for transit, right? And that's prohibited by the state constitution. So that, that's the rub. Only for state taxes. This was not a state tax. That's yeah, correct. That's, that's, that's the, the point. That's it's agreement. not a state tax. It's a great local area. tax. Yeah. This, you initially supported this because you worked with the lobbyists. You said, yes, this is fine. You were behind, and so was Luann, no. and then suddenly he disappeared. No, I think if you Bob, Bob Wilson was working issue. with you on this, yeah. Bob and Bob's lobby. <laughs> you have lots of, there are multiple taxing sources available for transit, and gas taxes are reserved by the 18th Amendment for road use. So that's where we're at on that. Then why were you supporting it at first? We were looking at the issue, trying to help you out to find a solution, but the issue is the 18th Amendment and the gas tax. Yes, but the 18th Amendment yeah. applies to state 
that generated the tax revenues. So the These are different. In that quite a bit, and I, I I'm not going to do a lawyer debate on this one, but <laughs> lawyers in Olympia said 18th Amendment applies to gas tax. Well, I think what they're saying is that's wrong, it turns out. Yeah, well, I know, but that's a constitutional amendment. You know, that's the 18th Amendment, so. Well, I, I'm going to just give my opinion here because I was right. so involved in okay. the... No. <laughs> 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 we'll get the debate going. Uh, you know, maybe it's never been adjudicated, and, maybe, and we obviously didn't have the resources to do that. But if you read the 18th Amendment, it's pretty clear, straightforward language. It says no state tax, uh, no fuel excise is collected by the state can be used for any other than construction or and maintenance of roads. Would you this give tax, a high tax to help us out? This tax is collected uh, by the county treasurer uh, and it, it I, really doesn't go, it's controlled by the county council. You know, it's, it's a gas tax. Go, it is a gas tax. Yes, would, gas you, tax. would you give a high tax? I would recommend that you out. work with your local taxing base here and there are lots of transit taxes that are out there to be able to get that done. Yes, I would recommend this, you use your text gas amendment tax that has to your road improvements in your area. So. Senator, this is a text amendment that has to be changed in Olympia. No, it's will not. You, no, no, sir. It's will not. you back us? In getting Sir, text no, it's, it's not. Simple. It's a constitutional issue. Okay. It's not an RCW. I think mean, she's an answer the question. All right. Who else? You, you all back this for you. Well, That's not what I said, 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 and uh, I find that in Washington State, you can smoke in a lot more public places than just anywhere else that I've ever been. And I don't know what all the rules are, but I, I think that, that Washington has sort of fallen behind the rest of the world about realizing this is a, a danger to, to health of everyone. And, and we need to make a little bit stricter kind of, kind of catch up to the rest of the world and say, hey, it's not okay to smoke at a bus stop. It's not okay to smoke within 20 meters of a entrance to a public building or wherever a public place. That's what we're doing. Or inside, but then whatever. Yeah, but, it, but I think it's, but it is still, I think a lot less. It's a lot more lenient than it is pretty much in most of Europe, uh, you know, Australia, uh, other Canada. I just wonder if it's just something I bring up. Like if it is not a state, it is a state. Uh, that's a state uh, issue. It is a state issue. And do you have do you have any opinion on that, or do you think it should get tougher? I think it's already pretty tough. I think it's good. Huh? Well, yeah, it's, I'm going to say, I don't think it's as tough as it is in other places. But so. I, I'm not sure. You know, I know it's tougher than it is in other states in America. It is. So I'm not sure how it is, how it compares to another. I say, I wish, it was, I wish it was more strict. I hear you. I, I appreciate your opinion. They just made it tougher this last year. Nothing's? The, well, they added, they, <laughs> they added, they added, they added vaping to, to it, and, they, and they're much more restrictive about how many signs you have to put out. I in know, Washington State. In Washington State. Oh, okay. I you're in Washington, no, 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 Washington State. They had a vaping place. Yeah, there's no vaping. So, I mean, you can't smoke inside. It's been quite the, the movement. And the posting rules are even stronger, I think, than right. in the past. Yeah, keep, keep that as hand up the wall, then you sort of switch. Go ahead. Senator, do you have a position on net neutrality? Federal issue. True. Okay. Yes. So, my well, view is. <laughs> No, you, 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 you're leaving ahead to my part B. Okay. Oh, what's your part B? Okay. Well, I just like to know what your position is. So net neutrality is a very complicated issue, right? Um, Actually, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be fast. It's very easy <laughs> if you don't have to actually vote on something to make a decision that tries to balance the needs of everybody out. If you just want to take the view of one sector, then it's a very easy decision and very easy to have, you know. But so we have to balance it out. So you have internet service providers like Comcast, right, yeah. who are not in favor of the net neutrality language because they're the ones that make the investment to provide the cable to your home. And then somebody comes out and builds out infrastructure to where you live, and then they are told you can no longer recoup your investment. We're going to allow everybody you not know, to serve everybody upon what you bring in equally. Um, everybody should have access. The provider should have the ability when they build out the system to be able to utilize it. So, so to make an analogy, if I'm a natural gas provider, yeah, do you think I have a right to say, if you use natural gas for your stove, I'm going to charge you one rate, and if you use it for cooking, I'm going to give you another rate, and if you use it for hot water, I'm going to give you another? 
Because that's exactly what Nedra Chong is. That would be very difficult to do. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it is a complicated issue. Um, we want to get billed out. What I want to do also is going back to the gentleman's question earlier about how I get billed out to Washington State as quick as possible. I want to make sure that I'm balancing out the needs of the people that are able to invest to build it out, to get it done, to get it built out in Washington State. So you have net neutrality, you have this whole thing of internet privacy, there are lots of different moving pieces in the world of technology. So it's a go, but it's also a federal issue. So, yes, sir. Are you aware of any actions about to be taken in the next year? by Washington State regarding riparian rights, beach properties, setbacks that are already way too far back. Have you heard anything with this EPA? Well, no, I have not. I mean, that's not come to my attention in terms of people trying to, to address that issue in the upcoming year. So if there's an issue you're concerned about, we can talk about it more in terms of things that we can do at the state level. I think that's more of a state issue than an EPA issue, um, I believe. It's getting to be confiscation by legislation. They have 150 foot setbacks on lots that are 150 feet deep. Yep. Why? Is someone saving us from something? So you can't build on it. Protect it from that big That's up. right. So the, then the value goes down. Then the county doesn't get the property taxes. And one thing also on the county stuff, right, is you have to push back on the county a little bit also, because here's the trick that the government will play. So the Department of Ecology in Washington State, for example, will not pass a, a rule saying you have to have a 150-foot setback. This is, we, we've dealt with this a lot with um, agricultural issues. But they will say, if you put in place a 150-foot setback and you're sued for not having a big enough setback, then we'll defend you in court. So they provide technical guidance to local governments. Now, the local government doesn't have to follow the technical guidance the Department of Ecology gives them, and they have the ability to go out and do what they want. So what we've been working on in the ag community has been smart buffers, not big buffers, right? So how do I get the most bang for the buck in a smaller buffer that allows my farmers to continue to operate rather than going with these big ones? So I think the same thing applies on the shorefront also, where there might be certain things you want to do, but the buffers that are put in place, we call them big dumb buffers, as of course the smart buffers that actually get the job accomplished in a way that allows you to be able to utilize your property. And property rights are incredibly important. We have to protect those. And when people come in and the government comes in with these takings, um, it, it impacts people like you wouldn't believe, just like the Hearst decision is having huge impacts on individuals. We have to fight back stronger on that also. So I hear what you're saying, um, but remind the county people that, that most of these things coming out of the Department of Ecology are guidance and not rules that have to be followed. From the state level. Got state levels, yeah, but so the county has the final say on that. We don't issue permits, so if you want to go do something with your house, you don't get a permit from the state of Washington. You, you get a permit from your county. So, or the city. You live in the city. Tommy's out here. Yeah. So, yes, sir. Well, we're going to get that and use our income tax. Um, income tax. <laughs> yeah, maybe that should be the last. Uh, I, mean, you know, I, I got all night, baby. I'll just keep going here. <laughs> um, um, so, on income tax, right? So, people always come back on this argument that somehow an income tax is fair and the tax and more stable and our tax structure in Washington State is not fair and not stable. If you actually look at the statistics, you'll see that's not true. Um, Oregon is an income tax state with no sales tax, right? Their revenue generation has actually been a lot less stable than Washington State's system of sales tax, property tax, and DNO taxes, right? That's the first thing. So people come in and say an income tax is more stable, simply not true. Um, second thing is, they always say, well, income tax is, is more fair uh, to low-income people. Again, not true, because what you're assuming then is that people paying income tax don't pass on the cost of that service to lower-income people. I'll give you the example of the biggest sales tax exemption in Washington State is what? Oh, food, right? You don't pay sales tax on food. Well, if I have a statewide income tax and all of a sudden Hagen has to go out and pay income tax on all of their stores, that cost gets passed down to all consumers, so you no longer have no tax on food, which is one of the most basic things that low-income people need to go buy. Everybody buys the food. So income taxes get passed on all the way through the food chain and then have an impact on low-income people, just like any other tax does. You know, it's the old saying, right? Don't tax me, don't tax the, don't tax that guy behind the tree. Nobody wants to pay the taxes. There's no perfect way to collect it. But this argument that keeps getting made that we somehow need to have an income tax because it's more stable, not accurate, Somehow it's more fair to low-income people, again, um, not totally accurate. 
And if you look at what happens in Washington State, we generate a lot of jobs, a lot of investment into Washington State because we don't have the income tax. And that's one of our big economic drivers and attractions of Washington State uh, has, has been that, which also creates more jobs uh, for people to go out and get. So there's lots of ways. Yes, sir. Well, we have, but you're talking about corporate taxes. Right. We're talking about personal taxes. We, we have a unique situation here in Point Roberts where our income is driven by the Canadian dollar. And if we had an income tax here rather than a sales tax, there would be more Canadians coming over and spending more money. No. Yes. Yeah. But if we didn't have the sales tax, their their dollar would be would have more value over here than it does right now. And and because of the devaluation of the Canadian dollar, and and over the last year, so you're not we have less Canadians income taxes don't live here, so not paying their income tax. But, uh, but they do say they're paying sales tax. They're paying sales tax. If they didn't have to pay the sales tax. They would they would get more money bang for their buck. I'd love to see buck. the math on that one because yeah. if you, if none of the Canadians are going to pay the income tax, but they all be paying the, they're currently paying the sales tax. Anyway, I, I don't know. I have not seen the stats on that. To be I'm just saying uh, I'm saying that that the sales tax affects the the sales tax. If we didn't have that here, would give would make their their dollar worth more worth more here, and they would spend more money. See, you know, a couple of years ago, the the, the uh, British Columbia they changed the way they collect their taxes up there. Yeah. And they actually got a sales tax exemption because we have a law in Washington State that says if you're from a province or a state in the region and you don't have a, a, a sales tax, you're an income tax state, so you can come into Washington State and purchase things sales tax free. So we had to actually go back and change our law to make it clear that people from Alberta and British Columbia actually had to pay the sales tax when they came into Washington. So, you know, it's one of those things. That you, you can't keep everything happy all the time, but that was an interesting piece of legislation that we did on that one. I'd like to say so. I mean, I've been here a year and a half. I came actually from Illinois, uh, moved here. In Illinois, there is a income tax and a sales tax and a property tax, and it's much higher. And they are in the biggest debt that any other state is in the whole nation. It, it doesn't. That doesn't help. Uh, it's how you use the money. Mark, exactly. like you from Illinois, we moved to Los Angeles, so I can. Yeah. There is zero correlation, a negative correlation between money spent or collected. And quality of services, whether it's education, yeah. roads, right. infrastructure, you name it. And I agree. There's yeah. two, different, just, two different issues, right? Yeah. One issue is how I collect it and how efficiently I spend it, yeah. right? And so you can have a great debate. Is an income tax better? There are certain things about an income tax, you know, that, that are very good. You, and you, you can play with an income tax a lot more than you can with the BNO tax, because then I can have a lot of different exemptions in the tax code to the income tax, right? You know, so that leads to activities. Um, the sales tax thing, we do the same thing. We do B and O tax rate reductions. We do sales tax exemptions on certain things, whether it be solar, whether it be you know um, extracted fuels for refineries, all those types of things. So again, I think to, to bring it back to center, it, it's how you use those dollars effectively. Right. And one of the things is, as in the legislature of the past you know 18 years, what I always believe the first thing you should do in the, in the budget year is determine how big the sandbox is going to be. Right? How much money you're going to have to be able to spend in the upcoming year, and then make a determination of how you spend it efficiently. Sometimes we go into a backwards, which is how much do we want to spend, and then try to figure out how you get it. And that's that's how you get the situation of Illinois or California, where you're spending way too much and you have to be responsible about. Here's how much we have coming in. Let's live within our means and set priorities and fund priorities. And I think that's where we've been effective in the majority coalition Congress over the past six years. Um, a couple of stats I'll give you before we before we wrap up here. I'm not going to keep you guys all day, but um, education spending. So before the majority, the majority coalition caucus is a caucus made up of Republicans and Democrats in the Senate. That's this is the majority caucus. Um, before this majority coalition caucus formed, 25 percent of all new dollars in the state of Washington went into education spending. Right. So every year, here's where you were the year before in your budget. You go up to this part here. Only 25 percent of that growth was spent on education. When the MCC took over, we flipped that on its head, and 75% of all new dollars went to education spending. That's how we were able to cut college tuition by 20%, make the biggest investments in K-12 education in the history of Washington State, some of the biggest in the country, in terms of the portion of our budget. We now have K-12 education to back over 50% of our budget for the first time since like 1982 or something. So we've been making those investments by setting priorities and living within our means and saying, here's how much we have coming in. And it hasn't always been easy, but that's the key thing I think we've done to meet a lot of those things and try to fund priorities that are important to the people of Washington State. So that's 
some of the things we've been able to accomplish over the past six years uh, by having some budget stability. We also have grown government quite a bit, to be honest with you. Uh, the economy in Washington State has been good. Population growth has been large. Um, so government has grown. I mean, this budget that we just passed grew Washington State by 14% in terms of our general fund spending. That's a big increase in terms of overall spending. Much of it went to education. Well, 75% of it went to education in terms of that 14% increase. So I think that's how you have to manage these things. In Washington State, we're good right now. It doesn't mean we're immune from the problems of Illinois and California. We've got to be responsible now with how we budget so going forward. Um, any other questions? I don't want to keep you guys here on it. Um, uh, Oregon has automatic voter registration. I'm a member of Block and Fair Voting. Yeah. Like familiar. Part of SEAC or an associate yep. of SEAC with Debbie. And um, so my question is at, uh, that for my very conservative friends who believe that zillions of illegal voters are voting, and uh, in Washington State a few years ago, they estimated 450,000 illegals voted. Why wouldn't we want to adopt an organ type system, which means that you, to be able to vote, you have to prove your your uh, citizenship, which right now, supposedly, there's a little bit of a loophole. You can go in and get your driver's license, and you don't have to be a citizen to get a driver's license in this state, but you can then say, I want wh whoever you are, you can say, I please register me, register me to vote. So a lot of people might agree with my conservative friends that that is a bit of a loophole. I'd like to close that loophole and the, uh, perhaps with the new driver's license, the enhanced driver's license. I don't know, but how about the Oregon system is what I'm asking. I think a person should make a choice for themselves if they want to register to vote, so I don't believe in automatic voter registration. Okay. You know, I also don't believe in vote by mail. I think that's a bad way to run a system. I think you should but that's how we vote. Yeah. 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 The only way we can vote. Yeah. We can fix that. Do <laughs> it. <laughs> Oh, I'm just saying, I'm not a big fan of vote by mail. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a good thing. get the ballots in the mail. What's wrong with it? Yeah. My concern is vote by mail. Yeah. Um, voter fraud. And so, pressure. One of the great things, and whether you're in a household where you're told by your spouse how to vote and they check your ballot before you send it in, that's a great concern to me. Um, communal activities where you're forced to go, you belong to an organization and they make you bring your ballots in and you have to fill them out in front of people. Um, that's very troubling. Uh, I believe that you should be able to go into the sanctity of a ballot booth and be able to vote where nobody can see it and not feel the pressure to vote in a certain way. Um, and that's uh, greatly concerning to me. I, I, I think that we have to, I believe very strongly that if you are a U.S. citizen and you are registered to vote, we should make it easy for you to be able to vote. Uh, we also to make sure that you are a U.S. citizen and registered to vote before you be able to vote in our elections. I think that's just the way it should be. I don't believe in this time and space continuum that some people believe in, in terms of voting which is if you're in a certain time, at a certain space at a certain time, you get a vote. You know, that's not the way it works. It's, it's, it, it, the citizenship is there for a reason, and you have to be a citizen to be able to vote. So we have to be able to control that. And I'm not making claims about X numbers of what big votes in the last election. I have no idea. And I actually, I'm putting together a letter to Kim Wyman right now, our Secretary of State, asking her how she actually enforces this, and asking her if they actually found anybody in Washington State who's registered to vote illegally. You know, let's say we haven't found anybody. Well, that's like saying you didn't arrest anybody for speeding last week on I-5 because you didn't have any state patrol troopers working on it. You know, we all know that there's a certain level of illegal registration going on, so to simply say you didn't catch anybody means it isn't happening. You know, <clears throat> it's a difficult case to be able to make. So I think we have to be careful about that. Like, again, again, I go back to, you know, how I opened this thing up. We're living through the biggest mass migration in human history. And uh, nationalism versus globalism. And that's really driving a lot of the tension you see out of Washington, D.C. right now. There's those big battles going on um, in those two camps, and, and we'll see what happens. But it, it will become more intense in the coming years, not less. And um, we live in exciting times. Um, we are very lucky, by the way, to live here in the 42nd District. Point Roberts is a phenomenal. Give me a break. Yeah. People from Illinois. It's a bad place, New Jersey. I right? might disagree on things. We all agree Point Roberts is a little nicer than the Garden State. Um, <laughs> And we have great opportunities. I mean, our economy is strong. We have a very diverse economy in Whatcom County. We're very blessed and thankful for that. You know, um, there are lots of good jobs available, whether it's university jobs, hospital jobs, refinery jobs, aluminum smelting jobs, all those manufacturing support services that are out there, the agricultural industry in Whatcom County. You know, it is an amazing, amazing place to live. And we have to work together to be able to protect that and make sure that we have good paying jobs that allow people to live here and work here and recreate here but also while we protect the things that are special to all of us. I mean, that's the key thing. And I, I believe my job as Chairman of the Energy Committee and the Environment Committee, I'm working very hard 
to accomplish both of those things. So we're going to work to protect Puget Sound. We're going to work to make sure that we have recreational opportunity available for all. We're also going to work very hard to make sure we have job opportunities available in Washington County. So um, with that, I would just like to say thank you. But this is a, a little bit more than I bargained for. Yeah. <laughs> and especially to be back into a corner with no way out of here. But, uh, I appreciate, I appreciate the tough questions, and I appreciate being pushed on subjects. And uh, I just like to thank you all for letting me come in here and talk to you this evening.